it's been a tough time for everyone and firms have been forced to reassess overheads and budgets. Um, and as a result, investment in longer term industry improvements and initiatives training uh, comes and training comes under the microscope. Here he is committed to the industry raising its gain through the avoidance of error and the benefits that that brings. There are the productivity improvements which are a benefit, but we also recognize the positive impact on quality, safety and sustainability. Many of you may be familiar with Geary to a sort of greater or lesser extent, but I think it's worth just reflecting on some key points about the origins of our thinking and our key messaging. Uh, we had an original strategy for change with the objective of generating a significant change in the efficiency of the UK construction industry through reducing the amount of errors made in construction. We carried out some research in 2016 into the impact of error, and this was funded by uh, industry participants as well as the CITB. The results showed how much waste was being caused by error. And as you can see here, it amounts to 21%. There was direct cost of error. This is basically the resources in putting the, the error right. There's the indirect cost of error. These are the impacts on other others surrounding the error and their immediate uh, cost impact. There's unrecorded process waste. Well, this is where people get things wrong and don't report it and just carry on and sweep it under the carpet. And then there's latent defects, which are these defects which come up after a client's received the, the building or infrastructure and, uh, and defects occur um, after the defects liability period has passed. Now, this research, uh, the method of research is accepted within academia as being 80% uh, correct in terms of the way it was carried out. So you can see that 21%, 21 billion pounds, if you take our GDP at about 100 billion, um, is a significant sort of a, a change difference between that and the two or three percent that you make as a uh, that people are making in the industry that's why it's so important the research looked at the root causes of error which you can see listed here um, the example that these examples these caught these were the uh, focus for Geary in addressing the the issues within the industry for example, the des design features quite frequently, frequently in the list. <clears throat> and we produced a, a guide to increasing value by avoiding error in design and the guides on the website. And Geary also provide leadership interface management and supervisory training targeted on error el elimination. This is CITB accredited. Originally, we secured the funding to carry out the research project, and I've spoken to you about what uh, what that research showed. And we set up Geary with five key aims: to create an, a new culture, to change attitudes and leadership, to engage all stakeholders in eliminating error, share knowledge about our error reduction processes, and improve skills. And this we've been doing. Our strategic aim is to improve construction productivity and quality, reduce cost and waste by eliminating error. We need to have the right culture throughout the industry so that people feel empowered to act in ways which reduce error, and that benefits everybody in the industry, those who live and work in the buildings and in the infrastructure we create. We need to change the way we work and behave now. If we do that, we'll have a better industry, um, more, which is more cost, cost effective and has a better reputation. Right, so now let's hear from Nick. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Cliff. Um, so if you're able to stop screen sharing, Cliff, that'd be, that'd be great. 
Yeah, that would be great. There we go. Brilliant. So I can see you all. Nice to see you. If you can all just give me a wave so I can see here. That's great. I feel connected to other human beings, which is uh, a bit of a novelty at the moment. Um, so what we're going to do today is uh, try and look at a number of different things um, related to the Grenfell disaster and what's happened since. So I will share my screen. Hopefully that is now enabled. Let's have a look. Here we go. Share. Yep, that looks like it's working. So the first thing we're going to do is have a look at what happened on the day. So we're just going to have a quick jump back in time and see what the public reaction was the day after the fire. So we can put ourselves back into that position. Next, we're going to hear from Steve Green about what has happened since Grenfell in terms of the various inquiries, the various reports, draft reports. So we can basically tell the story of what's happened since then until now. We're then going to spend a little bit of time thinking about our behaviours. What are the lessons in terms of how the industry has to behave and what does that mean for the Get It Right initiative? We're then going to hear from Paul Lowe, who is a, uh, a director at Waitman's, uh, sorry, a partner at Waitman's. And Paul will run us through uh, the sort of headline legal implications. And we're then going to have a Q&A session. So it's your chance to think about what are the key questions that uh, are still around relating to the, uh, the, the fire. And uh, we'll then get some answers from Paul and from Steve and also from anyone else with particular expertise. And then we'll finish off by asking the so what question. And the so what is what do we need to do right now? And therefore, how can Giri best support you? So that's what we're going to do. Um, now, as I said, we're going to start off by having a look back in time uh, at just a short video clip uh, from Newsnight the day after the fire. Um, and uh, let me check I've got all the right buttons. I think so. Opt here we go. Optimize for video. All right, I've clicked the right buttons and I'll share that screen. So this is not a uh, industry video. This is a general video, but it's just to get our minds back into what the situation was like five years ago. So here we go. How can we begin to understand the scale of the disaster that began in the early hours of this morning? What went wrong? And might it happen again? First, it's worth knowing that buildings like this are designed to contain fires. The idea is that if a fire breaks out, the fire brigade will have the time to combat it before it spreads. That's why the building had a so-called stay put policy. People were supposed to stay in their flats until the fire was dealt with. In this case, the, the tragic situation seems to be that the stay put strategy that was in place, in fact, has led to people being in the building as smoke and flames penetrated right the way through the, the property. Um, the, the normal strategy there is that, particularly with a tall building, then um, some people may be less able than others to be able to escape down staircases through, say, 20, 24 storeys of a building. And therefore, stay put is a recognised strategy where people may be less um, able, in a way, to rapidly escape down a staircase. The issue is that the fire did not stay contained. It raced through the building. So that stay put system broke down. And the critical question is why? The prime candidate for allowing the fire to spread is the so-called cladding, the insulation applied to the exterior of the building. This was added recently in 2015. I think the attention on the cladding is because we've seen in the reports and the photographs burning exterior of the building, and we've seen enormous areas where the exterior is destroyed. Um, and uh, of course, the, the, the system that we've used, and we use widely in this country, and, it, and it's, it's, um, it's an accepted system, is an aluminium composite panel system. And that system effectively is um, it's a thin panel, so it's probably six millimetres thick or so. And typically, it's made of two sheets of aluminium with a core in between. And that core is critical as to what it's made of. Because if we look at some of the um, fires elsewhere around the world and look at some of the fires in China or the Middle East, for example, that have been quite devastating, the core frequently has been a combustible um, type of plastic material. 
Recently has learned that the specific cladding in use in Kensington was a product called Rainobond. And in fact, there are two different versions of the cladding. The first is very fireproof. The second, which has a polyethylene core, is a bit less fireproof. And we've established it's the second less fireproof version of the cladding that they used. There have been questions about polyethylene core cladding from abroad. For example, following fires like this one in Dubai. Watch this polyethylene fire from France in 2012. It starts small, then quickly jumps up floors by the outside of the building. And within minutes, it's racing up the exterior. But the contractors who fitted the cladding in Kensington insist that their materials and work met the required standards. All modern British cladding is supposed to be of limited combustibility. Whether our fire regulation is in the right place, though, has been an open question since a smaller disaster in London in 2009. Six people died in the Lacanal House fire. Since then, though, not much has happened. That led to a very, very detailed um, coroner's inquest and report. Um, and part of that, they said that there should be a review of Part B of the regulations which govern, govern high-rise buildings. That's the fire regulations. Um, there's fire regulations, um, which hasn't yet been done. In October of this year, then Housing Minister Gavin Barwell said that it would be, um, but the sector's still waiting for that. And it was only in March this year, I think, members of the all-party parliamentary group on um, fire safety were, were warning that lives would be at risk if it wasn't. The Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, which owns the building, has big questions to answer. The government's response to lack in our house deserves probing too. We really need answers to make sure that other places don't suffer as Kensington has. Okay. So clearly not, uh, not an expert opinion uh, there, but interesting that the immediate focus was on the cladding, but actually we think now that it's maybe not quite that straightforward. So what I'd like to do now is hand over to Steve, who can talk us through what has happened since, since the fire. So Steve, over to you. Okay, thanks Nick. Right. Okay, so that, that was the 14th of uh, June, and not, not surprisingly, given the um, size of the, the tragedy, the, the next day the Prime Minister announced, so that was the 15th of June, a public inquiry, and that public inquiry uh, was led by uh, Martin Morby, who was appointed on the, um, on the 28th of, of June. And then in uh, July, we had... Um, Dame Judith Hackett appointed to carry out an independent review of the building regulations. So there's Dame Judith Hackett looking at the building regulations, Martin Morbig actually looking at the details around the, the fire that um, took place. And the inquiry actually started in September. And the, the, the scope of the inquiry, as I say, was the the causes of the fire and any other related issues. And if anyone who's um, watches the press, you'll be aware that the inquiry is, is still ongoing. Uh, and I'll show you on a few slides later uh, the website where you can dip in to see uh, see more. The, the inquiry was split into two phases. The first phase was actually completed at the end of 2018. And this first phase focused on, I think the legal description was the factual narrative of events on the, the night of the 14th of June. And many of the recommendations that came out of phase one related to the performance of the Fire and Rescue Services and London Fire Brigade and the, the stakeholder policy and the management of the, 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 the fire site uh, as the fire was ongoing. So that phase one's complete. Phase two is now underway. Um, which is looking at the cause of the events and how the tower came to be in a condition that allowed the, the fire to spread so rapidly. So then we had the uh, interim report from Dame Judith that came out in December 2017. And this is when we started to hear that uh, Dame Judith's view was that the the current regulatory system for ensuring fire safety in high-rise and complex buildings was 
not fit for purpose and it was not fit for purpose at any stage through the cycle of the construction through design construction and occupation um, I think Dame Judith said that the problem was connected to both the culture in the construction industry and the effectiveness or otherwise of the, the regulators. So that was the uh, interim. The final report came out in May 2018. And this is where Dame Judith's response to what she found was, was a new regulatory framework um, mandatory incident reporting for both fire and structural issues. We've got the introduction of duty holder roles and responsibilities, more robust gateway points proposed and um, through this whole life cycle, a much stronger change control in, in this, this type of uh, building. So then there was a consultation process that ran from June 2019, uh, ran for a couple of months, but um, there were 870 odd responses um, and it was those responses that were then taken into account so that we arrived at the draft building safety bill being published in July last year. Now, um, I mentioned I tell you this is the Grandfell Tower Inquiry website. There, there's the address. It's, it's fascinating. It, it, I'm sure most people involved in the construction industry will have seen some of the video evidence being given, but I, I'm really impressed how transparent and open this website is for anyone to go in. You can have a look at hearings because they're still going on live, but you can get, drill back into the archive and have a look at uh, the, the video evidence. And it, it's, it's very, very, uh, very interesting. Now, I've, I've got a, a colleague in construction excellence, a guy by the name of Dan Cooling from One Creative Environments, and he spent a lot of time researching the press cuttings that have come out whilst the inquiry has been ongoing. And Dan's very kindly uh, let me share the, those with you today. So it, it's in the style of a, a sort of have I got news for you type approach. So this is the, um, the first first one and this is about design so the, the sort of headlines that we were um, getting around design were no relevant experience and unfortunately this is a, a recurring comment as we go through the inquiry and um, the, the designer saying that the building regulations allowed a mix and a match approach and I think that this is you can either follow the approved documents or you can come up with an engineered solution or a mix and match of the two and also the issue that design and build seems to be creating disorder and I think throughout the inquiry you find there's, there's no one taking responsibility for everything everyone assumes everyone else is responsible so those were the design issues and then we get into the, the products and uh, it, it's quite shameful really you, you've got comments like deliberate deceit half-truths exploiting ignorance and I think exploiting ignorance in the design and the construction team uh, and, and just generally misleading and we have a look at procurement as well um, it, it appears as if the design team deferred their fees so that they didn't cross the OJU threshold there was no evidence of a competitive procurement process for the design the construction project um Ryden were 600,000 lower than their rivals but that was still 800,000 over budget and I think the client group uh, undertook some offline sort of off the record meetings despite their legal advisors um, advising them against it and then when we come into construction we've got similar issues inexperience a lack of training for management, a lack of guidance for the people actually working on the, the project and an estimating error. So I said um, Rydens was 600,000 cheaper than their nearest rival, but 200,000 of that was an estimating error. So it's quite likely that that estimating error in turn resulted in more value engineering perhaps to try and recover that 200,000. And then there's similar issues around certification. So um, there's omissions on uh, some 
PRE test reports. Uh, apparently, the clerk of works assessed compliance by asking the building control officer or the contractor if the work was compliant. And then the building inspector himself, he got 120 projects to look at. So I think that there's probably nothing, nothing there that we perhaps haven't heard of in the past in the construction industry, but you wouldn't expect to hear them all on, on one project. And we're seeing the manifestation of when all these things come together. So this has resulted in the draft building safety bill and it is the it's a gov.uk website that you can visit uh, and you can download the bill there's 331 pages uh, there's the explanatory notes 189 but i i found this the um impact assessment that's 84 pages a really interesting document and i recommend anyone who's interested in what it could cost the industry to have a look at the impact assessment, because for each of the gateways, um, the assessment uh, has a look at how much time it's going to take, and what the cost of that time is going to be, and therefore what the cost of the implementation of the bill is going to be. So quite interesting. And at the heart of the bill is the new building safety regulator who will be in place again, as Dame Judy Tackett pointed out in her review, through the life cycle of the building. So from planning through to and including the occupations stage, building safety regulators will be in place. And they're effectively under the HSE umbrella, not surprisingly, given that Dame Judy Tackett was an ex-chair of the HSE. And you're, you're seeing lots of um, similar roles in terms of duty holders um, and the like uh, that will have significant obligations imposed upon them through through the legislation. So that's that's me. That's the whistle stop tour of where where we are now. So shall I stop sharing, Nick? Yes, please. Yeah, if you would, that'd be great. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Steve. Definitely a whistle, tops, whistle stop tour, but uh, very interesting to see the layers and layers of inquiry and subsequent reports that have come out from, uh, from the uh, disaster. And uh, also interesting to see how you looked at those various different elements of it in terms of the, uh, the product, design, um, suppliers, so all very multifaceted. So if you remember, the next thing we're going to consider is how should the industry behave? Now, behavior is something that is a particular interest for GIRI because from all of our research, we have seen that getting the behavior right underpins avoiding error. So I think it's reasonable to think that behavior might well have an influence on uh, building safety. But what I'd like to do, please, is put you all into breakout groups. So you'll be in breakout groups of about four or five. And I'd like you just to spend five minutes discussing and identifying what do you think are the most important behaviours that the industry needs to urgently adopt? So if you can just discuss what behaviours must the industry adopt now? Um, so I'll ask Helena, can you open up the breakout groups? Um, when you come back, I'll ask you all to type your answers individually into the chat box so we can have a big download of thoughts. So just keep a record as you go through, but think about what behaviours must we now adopt? And I will see you all in five minutes. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I know the room I was listening to had some very interesting discussions. What I'd like to do now, because there are so many of us on the call, is if I can ask you all, please, to open the chat box, which on my screen is down at the bottom right, just the speech bubble. If you can open the chat box and please just type in a key behaviour you think needs to change within the industry. If you can type one behaviour per message, that'll be great. And what we can do is then we can extract it. Um, but the interesting thing is, if when you're not typing, you can read through other people's uh, other people's comments. So we've got um, share lessons learnt, taking ownership, transparency, transparency coming up, 
So already we're seeing the same themes being repeated. So please do all put your comments in the box there. So there's definitely a, uh, a theme of ownership, a theme of transparency, a theme of uh, sharing information, maybe overcoming conflicts of interest, where actually we all say we should share, but we know that commercially it might be in our best interest not to share. Um, and definitely a little big leadership theme in here as well. So uh, what we will do is we will extract all of that data from the chat box and, uh, and just see if we can pick up any patterns. Um, what I'd like to do now, though, is uh, just to share what it is that Giri is already doing um, in terms of um, behaviour change. There we go. Um, and obviously, we've developed our behavioural training based on um, based on avoiding error. But what will be interesting is to see how closely you think what we're doing already for error aligns with what you've identified for um, making for complying with the building safety bill. So the the Giri error free culture and the behaviors around um, uh, error free have a number of themes. This is essentially the Giri golden thread. And we talk about getting the behaviors right, getting the communication right and getting the processes right. So let's have a look at that bit of behaviors. Well, one key concept that we always teach on all of our GUI training courses is this idea of build it in your brain, whereby essentially it is taking ownership. Do you know what you're doing before you do it? And crucially, this ability to press pause to avoid error. Um, so rather than saying stop, which we know has uh, uh, nuances of safety and also has contractual implications, getting people to say press pause to avoid error. So that's one of the key elements of behaviours that we focus on. And another thing that we explore, particularly with the supervisors and managers, is this idea of categorising behaviour and identifying that we can have behaviour that is both helpful and unhelpful, but you can also have <laughs> behaviour where people agree and they do exactly what they're told, or they disagree and think for themselves. I've got it on here. <laughs> oh, can, there we go. Thank you. Um, and, and we identify that the real danger area is this unhelpful agreement. People doing exactly what they're told to do, even if they know it's wrong. And we can think of this as the stovepipe, the trade who do their own thing, um, or designers focusing on their own element without thinking wider. And what we identify is this helpful disagreement, people thinking for themselves is where we really need to be. Let's have a look at one of the other elements then, communication. Um, all of our training around communication focuses on the concept that it's a closed loop. So we don't just do the first two bits. We don't just encode and transmit messages. We don't just do designs and throw them into a document control system. We don't just write emails and hit send. But actually, we need feedback. We need feedback from the people receiving that information, as that is the way that we know whether it's been correctly understood, whether there are any issues with it. And the simplest way to do this at the lowest level is regular use of open questions, forcing people to give their honest answers, not allowing people to just give yes, no simple answers. And then in terms of processes, one of the things we focus on with the leadership uh, stream is the idea of doing uh, what's often known as a pre-mortem, our get it wrong exercise, where we think about what could go wrong. We time jump into the future, look backwards and say, what are the disasters? What can go wrong? Therefore, why does that happen? And dig down to the root causes so that we're not just trying to address problems one at a time, but we're addressing the underlying root causes of behaviour. So what I'd like to do now is ask you all to think, how can Giri best influence behaviour um, in the wake of the Grenfell Fire disaster? What should Giri be doing to influence behaviour? It might be what way should they influence behaviour or what method should Giri try and influence the industry? But I'll just give you a couple of minutes now, I'll stop talking, to please type your ideas into the chat box. And then we'll hear from a few of you on what you think Giri can do to influence behaviour right now.
Okay, great. Let's have a let's maybe hear from uh, a few people. So um, we've got Paul. Paul Hallam, you mentioned a carrot and stick approach. Could you expand on that? I knew you'd pick me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe league tables is an easy one where you can obviously praise the people who get to the top of it, and uh, perhaps highlight the ones that are further down the leagues. But you need to get everybody on board, and obviously the the worst performing people or companies may not be as willing to, to get in the system, so they have to be identified from others within the system who they're, who they're working with, perhaps. Um, yeah, it's not going to be easy, is it? <laughs> OK, interesting. Thanks, Paul. And uh, Rupert, you've said influencing boardrooms. Maybe I can ask you to expand on that a bit. Yeah, I, th I think it's um, no, nobody would would deliberately do it, surely, um, although some of the Grenfell sort of sound bites indicate that people sort of knew, but you really can't imagine that, that someone running in their business thinks that, but do they really know what goes on down on the ground? We're so um, keen on making sure that our publicity is good at corporate level, we're satisfying customers, meeting customer budgets, etc. But but do we really understand on a sort of a balanced scorecard how we're achieving that? And do they really know? Uh, and that sort of thing. I mean, probably everyone on this call is on this call because they've got an interest in sort of quality and error and that sort of thing. And we know that there are stuff going on outside every minute of every day. But you ask our chief executives and you'll get the corporate message that we're doing a wonderful job satisfying our clients, etc. But uh, do they really, really know? And we've done some recent process safety, you know, I'm sure they didn't think Huntsfield was going to blow up, but it did. Yeah, you know. really, really interesting. Thanks, Rupert. And uh, it goes back to um, a comment that was made earlier about the difference between what we say and what we do. And that harks back to a previous Geary forum where we were looking at behaviours and we identified this thing of the say do gap, the gap between what we say we do and what we really do. So it definitely sounds like there is a there's a, a big a big opportunity there if you can close that gap between what we say we do and what we really do. Okay, some really interesting comments in the chat box there. Um, please do read those. I'll capture them, but we'll not talk through any more at the moment um, because now it's time to hand over to Paul, um, and Paul will talk us through uh, the. The headline legal implications coming out of the inquiry and the bill. So, uh, Paul, maybe I can uh, hand over to you, please. Yeah, I've just made um, Cliff the presenter so he can share his slides. Okay, uh, great. Okay, Nick, thank you for that. That's great. If, if the slides could come up, that would be uh, very, very helpful. Thank you. So, but by way of background, for those of you who who don't know, we've got I'm the Paul. slides. I don't know why you made me presenter. I, I can share, Helena. Do you want me to share? Should okay. I carry on, chaps? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh, hang on. Wrong. There we go. Right. I think you can see the slides now, can you? Yeah, I can see the slides. Sorry. Uh, before I, I was just saying before the, the interruption that, um, so I, I'm Paul, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm a partner at at Waitmans. Um, I'm a lawyer who, um, who specialises in construction and insurance matters. Um, regressively, building safety issues have become, become top of my pile in the last few years. I, I'm acting for one of the, the core participants in the, the Grenfell Tower inquiry, and I was called upon last summer to assist the Cabinet Office in the uh, uh, the Ministry of Community Housing and Local Government on drafting the building safety bill and its implications. I've also been involved latterly in the development of the cladding remediation scheme, which you may have seen announced by the Secretary of State, uh, Robert Jenrick, in uh, February um, of this year. So all, all of this, I'm afraid, is, has become incredibly familiar. Um, what I, I will do is just talk through a few of the most pertinent uh, issues and um, by which I mean I will touch upon um, what I've been asked to talk about today are uh, principally the, the enforcement powers which will be available to the building safety regulator and perhaps also to add a little bit of um, background to some of the duties that are being imposed. So if you could just turn, have the next slide please, thank you. 
the building safety, the draft building safety bill, as it, as it makes its way through through the House of Commons, imposes a number of duties on construction professionals, and I, I don't have time in, in in the next ten minutes to to go through those in in any detail. Um, but as you may recall, I, I did a presentation in um, October for this group, but I did go through the detail of the of the bill. Um, I suppose the, the the single biggest issue, I, I guess, are the 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 creation of new tortious duties, which is a kind of a legal term for legal duties imposed upon parties, and um, and the creation of a new profession, that of the building safety manager, which at the moment is causing a huge amount of debate as to who will have the abilities and the expertise to fulfil that role. Um, and whether there would be any insurance available to somebody who fulfills that role. If I was interested in learning a bit more about the detail of the, um, uh, of, of, of the, the various regulatory elements of the bill, then as I say, have a look at my, um, my webinar from October, which I believe is on the, uh, the Get It Right website. But for today's purposes, I think the, the key point to focus on is that there are a raft of new obligations being placed upon parties to construction projects and obviously this at the moment only deals with projects which, which fall within the scope of the bill and as that stands that's buildings of 18 meters plus um in residential occupation and there is at the moment um some discussion as to whether the scope of the bill will be extended but that's you know as in, in, in a very brief summary that is um that is what we're likely to see come on the next slide please One of the most, I think, one of the most novel elements of the bill, and perhaps the element which which, which concerns Gary and, and draws upon some of the um, some of the, the principles which which underlie the Get It Right initiative, is the the new obligation to um, require mandatory reporting um, of structural and fire safety occurrences, which are likely to give rise to risks to life uh, or to significant risks to the integrity of a building something which of course the getting right initiative has has called for in in to the extent that this is a requirement to share industry knowledge and a requirement to make mandatory reports um at the same time as the mandatory reporting regime there's also a corollary voluntary reporting regime which is also in operation and that voluntary regime um, enables parties to make reports to the new regulator on a um, for those occurrences which are of a less serious nature can the next slide please the obligations to make these reports fall upon all the parties to um, to the building project in question um, and include the establishment of the the accountable person regime, which is a a regime which requires buildings to be managed safely during the um, the lifespan of the building. Um, that information, as I say, is presented to the to the building safety regulator, and, and the regulator will publish information and share information with the construction industry on a on an anonymous an aggregated basis. Now, I think the, the, the interesting point about that for, for the Get It Right initiative is that we've been calling for this type of information sharing for some time. And once the bill becomes law, there will now be a, a statutory footing for the sharing of, of safety information along these lines. As I say, that information may be relatively restricted given the scope of the bill and what I suspect will be a fairly limited number of notifications to the regulator, but nonetheless, the, uh, the statutory framework will be there. Go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So, so just to turn to um, the regulator's enforcement powers, and I'll just touch very briefly on some of the, some of the insurance uh, issues, but I, I won't spend a lot of time considering considering the insurance elements, which probably are out of the scope of what we're, we're here to consider today. Um, the reason why it's said that the, um, the, the, re the new regulator will have teeth is because of the regulator's ability to prosecute, prosecute managers and directors of organisations 
where a breach of the, the new regulations can be attributed to, to the default of um, that corporate body and, and the manager in question, which is, of course, I think something which is, is, is akin to what we've seen in, in the health and safety world within the last 25 years. And now we're getting to the stage where we're building safety is, is being viewed in the same light. And I would suggest to you that the ability to bring criminal prosecutions against um, directors and, uh, and officers of organisations is likely to have a um, likely to have have, have a salutary uh, impact upon uh, those who are subject to the bill. But it doesn't just uh, stop there. Could I have the next slide, please? The regulator also has powers to issue various types of compliance notices and that's during both the design and, and the construction phase of of works um, those notices include things like stop notices or conditions which parties will be required to work to um, or work will be be halted by the regulator on site um, the bill also provides for the regulator to gather evidence I, I, akin to what you might see from a criminal prosecutor, so uh, enabling the regulator to enter premises and gather data. You, you kind of have in mind sort of dawn raids that um, people uh, people sometimes worry about. Well, the regulator is going to have the powers to do to do all of that um, as well. And you know, the final bit, I suppose, is um, holding building control bodies to account. Now, I won't, again, I won't spend time considering it in detail, but the short point here is that the, the building control process is one which has been heavily criticised during the course of the, the Grenfell Tower uh, inquiry. And the, regulate, the new regulator will have powers to oversee that and suspend inspectors um, when there are concerns about, the, uh, uh, the concerns about how, how sh short um, a particular um, inspector is falling in connection with its review regulations. The final point to, to make on this on this piece is that um, as well as the, the, the ability to send people to jail, um, the, the regulator will also have the ability to levy fines against parties who are defaulting. Um, whether those fines are insurable is, is, a, is, a, is a matter of debate. I think the consensus at the moment is that, that they won't. But we might sort of have have this um, consider this in the context, perhaps, of the data protection world. And, and some of you will recall the uh, um, the problems that the, the uh, GDPR regulations, when they were instigated several years ago, caused people who are active in in the collection of data and the potential to levy a significant fines in connection with breach of the data regulations was uh, a concern for the markets. The same point falls here, I think, when it comes to regulatory fines to be levied by the, the building safety regulator, uh, which I suspect are, are liable to are likely to be, to be very substantial. Um, OK, next slide, please. So just to, yeah, that that's me done in a, um, a whistle tops um, tour of some of the, the enforcement powers of the, the regulator. I think the, you know, the, the, the points I, I think we, we should be sort of considering for today's purposes are whether this this is very much a we talked about earlier a carrot and stick approach well this is very much a stick to stick which 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 the which parliament is seeking to impose upon the construction industry regrettably the um what we've seen coming out of the grenfell tower inquiry has only led to greater concerns about the conduct of certain construction professionals and and contractors and the government has formed a view that the only way to deal with this is through legislation, akin to perhaps what we've seen in the world of health and safety. But you know, the point still remains that the, the building safety bill, and when it becomes an act, will only focus upon those high-rise um, residential developments. And whether there is scope for extending um, these regulations to other areas, and whether it should be seen as a gold standard, which all construction projects should should seek to meet, I think that remains an open question. So I'll leave you with that question. I think that's uh, that's all, all from me.
Brilliant. Thanks very much, Paul. That's uh, yeah, clearly a, a huge amount of detail that you could go into. So thank you for providing us with that, uh, that very quick overview. Um, I've seen already some questions sneaking into the chat box there, and you left us with a question, Paul. But what I'm going to ask you all to do now is we're going to put you back into your breakout groups um, for about seven minutes. And what I'd like you to do is please come up with your questions. So we're not trying to answer them at the moment. We're just trying to identify what are the questions that industry currently has in regard to this draft bill and all of the myriad implications that might fall out from it. Um, so please, in your breakout rooms, think about what questions you have from industry right now. And then when you come back, I'll ask you to enter them in the chat box and we will then draw on Paul and Steve's expertise and also the expertise of other people on this call to start trying to answer, if we can, a few of those questions. Great. OK, well, that's two minutes. I've seen a whole host of questions flowing into the box there. So please keep typing if you've got more questions. Um, so let's kick off. What we'll do now is we'll have uh, we'll address some of these questions to uh, Paul and to Steve. And the way we'll run this is we'll give Paul and Steve a chance to answer. And then whoever's question it was, um, if they want to come back probably just once to clarify, see if their question has been answered or see if there's any uh, any additional question. Um, so let's uh, start off. There are lots of questions about insurance. Um, so let's pick one of those. Uh, where are we? Let's have a look. So let's. Um, oh, well, actually, Steve Green, you put the question down. Let's address Steve Green's question to Paul Lowe. And basically, it's a nice, simple one. Will we get PI cover? So, um, Paul, maybe you can you can tackle that one. Well, it depends who uh, who do we is, I suppose. Um, and it depends you know, who, who's seeking cover. General, general observations on the PI market, I think, are, are you know, look, I, I can spend another half an hour telling you about that at the moment. So I've, I've got a whole different webinar set up for PI issues. The, the PI, the, in a very, very short terms, the, the PI market is a distress one at the moment. There's not a lot of um, capacity available. And, and as many of you will know, uh, more restrictive terms are being placed on professional indemnity insurance. And premiums have been, uh, have been going up considerably. Again, I, many of you will be aware of those insurance market conditions. Um, so will there be a professional indemnity insurance available to professionals involved in this? I think you know, the standard answer is, well, you know, that you can always get covered if you're prepared to pay enough. I'm not sure that will necessarily be the case here. I think those who are conducting world building safety manager are going are gonna to struggle. And I'm not, I haven't spoken to the insurance market and various underwriters who are act, who are leading and active in this field I, i'm not like to provide cover for that particular new profession um certainly it would be, be will be difficult it may be the case that somebody else steps in and you, you may have seen it as part of the secretary of state's announcement last last month regarding the cladding remediation program the government announced the establishment of a um, new government backed professional indemnity insurer for surveyors conducting EWS1 surveys. It may, be, it may be the case that that government backed professional indemnity insurer has a wider scope of operation than purely limited to EWS1s. Um, again, that's a piece of speculation. I, I look, I think, I think the professional indemnity market probably will be, be difficult, I think is, is, is the answer. And um, um, you know, it may it may be it may be in a few years' time when there's more capacity, more um, more availability of insurance. But at the moment, I think that's a you know it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you, thanks, Paul. Um, does anyone want to come back to Paul on that? Any sort of uh, follow-on in terms of insurance? Anyone got a burning question? Please just shout out if you do. I I, I got one, Paul. Um, the, uh, when I'm thinking about insurance, I'm thinking about this sort of joint final sign off by principal designer and principal contractor and client before you can get completion. And it's, it's sort of around the insurance. So would you get insurance as the principal designer if you didn't have a check in brief while the thing was being built? And therefore, will it change the scope of appointment? 
So will every principal designer have a check-in brief? Um, that, yeah, that's a good question. I suspect you will, there will be some form of, of checking process. I, I, to the extent that, that that will involve insurers, I'm, I'm, I'm less certain. I don't, think, I don't think particularly it will. I think for design and build insurer, you 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 will still be looking at your design and construct insurance to cover you for any design failing. I think the other important thing to bear in mind here is that the, the the draft bill calls for greater collaboration. You know, so every step of the way we're meant to be collaborating with our with our principal designers and with our with our contractors. So that that ought to ought to be borne in mind as well. Um, I think you know the real observation is that by the time you get to the final. Uh, For um, significant problems on the on project to be identified by them, you know this is meant to be an ongoing issue. So, uh, you know, I, I do have concerns about people failing to get sign off the final gateway. I think that, that there's a there's a distinct possibility that that might give rise to um, an increase in, in claims. We will have to wait and see. Um, if it does, I think my prediction is that the you know the pressure indemnity market will be. You know, increasingly reluctant to to be p picking up those costs. I think the part of the problem here is, I mean, again, we probably don't have time to go into to a detailed discussion of it. But the, the using D and B as a procurement route, it just becomes a very very expensive way, particularly for the insurance market, to to be picking up liabilities. I'm afraid it just means that everybody's got a claim, you know, against everyone else. So uh, yeah, there's more I think that can be done on procurement as well. Thank you. Um, I've seen a question from Keith. Hi, Keith. Keith Horsley. Um, about when do the next um, the next documents come out? Do you want to just explain your question, Keith? Uh, yes. Hi, Nick. Uh, hi. Um, turn the camera on. Um, yeah. So the the building safety bill, uh, draft building safety bill, I believe, makes reference to uh, the use of secondary legislation, or certainly certainly the. Uh, that there's a, a view that there will need to be a lot of secondary legislation to tell us a lot of the detail that's missing from the from the bill. Uh, so there's there's a number of things unknown, I and mean, we don't know when the bill itself will come into force. But we also don't know when we're even going to see the draft of all this secondary legislation that will tell us more about what we're going to need to do. So I don't know who can take that. I mean, Steve, do you know anything about that, or Paul? Paul, oh, it's one for Paul. <laughs> Did you get that, Paul? It's when will the secondary legislation be out? Hi, Paul. Oh, I think we might have lost you briefly there. So a question there, Paul, was um, do, do we know when all of the secondary legislation and supporting documentation will be uh, produced and available? OK, it looks like we've had a catastrophic failure with Paul. Either that or he really didn't like your question, Keith. I think it was too hard. <laughs> It's like that, no, not having that one. Okay, well let's let's move on to another question, uh, possibly. Um, so um, we had uh, Liz Bennett. You made an interesting point about um, not trusting industry bodies to be creative enough. Um, could you could you expand on on that one, please, Liz? Yes, uh, we're taught over and over again that everything comes back to money. Um, and, and that applies to our institutions and our professional body as well. Um, and I, I think they, they're going to face huge problems. And we're an industry that tends to look back at codes and standards. We tend to like to do things that we're comfortable with that we've done before. I think that's particularly true of our institutions right across the board. I don't mean just the institutions. I mean, pan industry bodies and so on. And, and I think that we uh, are going to really struggle to get the actual capabilities we want. Somebody else has put a question around the, the, the fact that the skill set is highly variable throughout the project and on two different projects. And actually to get a one size fits all for that is just a ridiculous thing. Happy to talk more about it because I chair the Design for Health task group and we've tried it. And we've had academics on the subject and stuff. It's just impossible. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Does anyone want to respond to that or have a comment to add to or question for the, Elizabeth? The, the only thing I'd say that, that there is a, a competence steering group that sort of underpins the Building Safety Bill that's led by uh, BSI. Uh, and they're trying to establish 
sort of competency tests across consultants and ultimately down to SMEs, but I think they've started at the high level in terms of designers. Um, but it's it's not an easy task because one of one of one of my follow-on questions was we we we've recognized that there's an issue with competence in the industry, which is why we're going to test it. When you test the competence of a consultant and they're found to be lacking, does that again coming back to the PI cover, does that immediately mean they no longer have PI cover? And how long do they have to have to remedy the shortfall in their competence? So competence is a big issue in the building safety bill because it's what Dame Judith Hackett identified and we saw it in the press cuttings across design, procurement, construction, competence is an issue. The industry can I just, uh, is an issue. Can I just make a point there, please? Um, we did discuss competency in our breakout room, um, and uh, it is very important that we, we get a set of standards uh, uh, and understanding of competency and, and uh, that it's reg there's some regulation, we, but we still have to think about the culture because even if we've all got certificates saying how wonderful we are and competent, if we haven't got the culture right and we're still not got the um, honesty and, uh, and things like that within the industry that we need, then having the certificate on the wall isn't uh, isn't going to make that that difference, is it? No, but it, 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 sorry, Nick, if I can just add that the bill defines competence as appropriate skills, appropriate knowledge, appropriate experience, and appropriate behaviours, and I think that the behaviour is the cultural. Bit, I think, and organisational capability, but yeah, and I just don't see how the competency rules are going to test what someone's behaviour is going to be like when they're under pressure on site. If someone's coming with the whip, mm -hmm. saying you're costing me money, get on with it. Uh, that that's where the behaviours have really got to go to, haven't they? So that's really that's really interesting there, Cliff. And it sounds like we're getting back to this idea of this say do gap, that difference between what we say we do and what we actually do. And that leads very nicely on to our last question, which is what should Giri now do to support you? We can see that there are myriad problems, but what support do you want from Giri? Um, so can we please put you back into your breakout groups for five minutes? And just to discuss that final question, what support do you now want from Giri in response to the Building Safety Bill? Great, some really interesting uh, comments flooding in. Please keep them coming in, your suggestions. Um, maybe can I ask Nigel um, to just expand on your point? You were talking about uh, publishing, possibly. Maybe you could just explain the logic there? Uh, yeah, hi everyone. So we were just saying that one of the things that I think Geary could relatively easily do is publish guidance. And I was showing up, flagging up, um, I was saying that the RIBA is having to do something similar because uh, architects will have a, uh, be competency testing every five years to maintain their membership of the RIBA. And they've published this little booklet, which is not very long, it's full of pictures. Um, so something like that, I think could be quite a quick win and uh, would help to promote um, Giri's um, remit, I think. Brilliant, thank you. And uh, Karen, I think you said something about helping interpret, Giri helping us interpret the legislation. Is that is that along the same lines, your comment there? Um, it is, yeah, it's exactly that. You know, there's lots of stuff that gets published. If you could just interpret that for us and come back and let us digest it and put it in something that's meaningful. Brilliant. OK, thank you. Um, and, and Ruth, you talked about changing the negative culture. Do you want to just expand, expand what you mean there? I'll just unmute myself first. Um, yes, so I have found working in architecture that there tends to be a um, like a past the buck culture. Um, I shared an anecdote of being told on my first day um, to never take blame for, never accept blame for anything, never accept responsibility. Um, and I think it's that kind of um, lack of taking responsibility that's really wow. leading to errors compounding. 
really interesting. Gosh, yeah. So it's like when you, like you're told, if you have a car crash, never admit liability. If we've got an entire industry built on that, what on earth are we, what on earth are we hoping for? Great. And uh, Dave Jones, I saw you had a, a comment. I can't find it now, but do you want to just explain what you put, Dave? Yes, um, I, Gary, it's so important, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big body, actually. We've got, that, what, 60, 60 over now. Um, it's tier ones, tier two, so you can drive it as a body, drive it, you know, create its own. Uh, now, you know, ICM have joined. I was with, been speaking to Tom many, many years, actually, until we got there. So we were joined at the hip and uh, Cliff and uh, that we've made it possible. We're, in, we're amongst you. I, in 2018, I, I stood up at London Build and I trademarked the registration of competence. Um, you know, <laughs> we're, we're not, we're not going to let you and Elizabeth have an have an argument over that one again. But uh... <laughs> no, okay, all right, no, hello, Liz. <laughs> Love you really. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, thanks, David. Well, we are rapidly approaching the end. So what I'll do is I'll just sum up what we've done and uh, then hand back to, or rather, I won't sum up. I'll uh, I'll show you what we've covered and then hand back to Cliff for his summary. So uh, we we basically had a look at behaviours and we've captured what you all said about behaviours and the different colours just show trends within the behaviours that we were looking at. We then had a look at uh, what should GIWI do to influence behaviour, so we captured that. We then came up with a whole host of questions. So these are the questions, and out of that, we've just seen some uh, recommendations of where you think GIWI can best fit. Um, and with that, I'll hand back to uh, Cliff, who will, uh, I'm sure, sum it all up excellently for us. Hello again, everyone. Um, yeah, obviously I was in a breakout group and we had our discussions, but it's been very, very interesting to see the range of considerations for what Giri could or should be doing. Um, and I suppose it's a reminder to me, uh, I've taken up the reins as the executive director after we sadly lost Tom Barton last year. And there's always this feeling that I have, I've got to do more, I've got to do more, I should be doing this and I should be looking at safety and all these sorts of things. But we keep having to bring ourselves back to what is Geary about, what it's for. And Geary is about avoiding error. And how is avoiding error going to help us with the building safety bill? How is a, how is a, uh, a body which is interested in persuading people to think about avoiding error, press pause, think about what you're doing? How is that going to help with the building safety bill? Well, I think the competency question comes into it, but it was interesting when Steve ran through his lists of what makes up a competent person. And the first three we can recognise are things that you can go out and buy training for at the drop of a hat. Somebody will give you uh, somewhere, some. there'll be a new profession in providing advice on how to uh, interpret the building safety bill uh, and you know when we had CDM we had the the new trade of competent CDM inspectors and we'll get the same with the building safety bill what Geary's about is the fourth item the behavior what Geary can help with is behavior and what we're trying to do is influence behavior influence people to think about what they're doing and do it right and if you think it's wrong, say something. The culture within the industry has got to be telling us that we, we're open, we're transparent, and we can say, oh, that doesn't look right. Oh, I think I've done that wrong, or whatever it is. So my message to you, and thank you very much for all the input. And I think I'm reading that Geary's got to stick to its guns and aim on affecting the culture in the industry. And that will help you when you're dealing with the building safety bill. Thank you very much for coming today. And we'll try and have a, another interesting forum for you in the future. And if you're not a member, join. <laughs> Thank you. And just to add, we'll be sharing the resources uh, on our website and through our newsletter um, in the next week. So if you need any of these, um, then please do sign up if you're not on our um, newsletter already on our website. Thank you.